This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot org. Today's reading by Miet of Miet's Bedtime Story Podcast. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 12, Part 2. Here, says Joe, doing the honours. Here, citizen. Slan Leet, says he. Fortune, Joe, says I. Good health, citizen. Gob, he had his mouth halfway down the tumbler already. What a small fortune to keep him in drinks. Who is the long fellow running for the mayoralty, Alf? says Joe. Friend of yours, says Alf. Nanan, says Joe. The member? I won't mention any names, says Alf. I thought so, says Joe. I saw him up at that meeting now with William Field, MP, the cattle traders. Harry Lopez, says the citizen, that exploded volcano, the darling of all countries and the idol of his own. So, Joe starts telling the citizen about the foot and mouth disease and the cattle traders and taking action in the matter and the citizen sending them all to the right about and bloom coming out with the sheep dip for the scab and a hoose drench for coughing calves and the guaranteed remedy for timber tongue because he was up one time in a knacker's yard walking about with his book and pencil here's my head and my heels are coming till joe cuff gave him the order of the boot for giving lip to a grazier mr noel teach your grandmother how to milk ducks pisser burke was telling me in the hotel the wife used to be in the rivers of tears sometimes with mrs o'dowd crying her eyes out with her eight inches of fat all over her couldn't loosen her farting strings but old cod's eye was waltzing around her showing her how to do it what's your program today i humane methods because the poor animals suffer and experts say and the best known remedy that doesn't cause pain to the animal and on the sore spot administer gently Gob. He'd have a soft hand under a hen. Gaga gara, cluck, cluck, cluck. Black Liz is our hen. She lays eggs for us. When she lays her eggs, she is so glad. Gara, cluck, cluck, cluck. Then comes good old Uncle Leo. He puts his hand under Black Liz and takes a fresh egg. Gaga gaga gara, cluck, cluck, cluck. Anyhow, says Joe, Field and Nanetti are going over tonight to London to ask about it on the floor of the House of Commons. Are you sure, says Bloom, the councillor is going? I wanted to see him as it happens. Well, he's going off by the mail boat, says Joe, tonight. That's too bad, says Bloom. I wanted particularly. Perhaps only Mr. Field is going. I couldn't phone. No. You're sure? Nanan's going too, says Joe. The League told him to ask a question tomorrow about the Commissioner of Police forbidding Irish games in the park. What do you think of that, citizen? The Slua Naharien. Mr. Coconacre, multifarnum, nut. Arising out of the question of my honourable friend, the member for Shillag, may I ask the right honourable gentleman whether the government has issued orders that these animals shall be slaughtered, 
though no medical evidence is forthcoming as to their pathological condition. Mr. All Falls, Tamashant Count. Honourable members are already in possession of the evidence produced before a committee of the whole house. I feel I cannot usefully add anything to that. The answer to the honourable member's question is in the affirmative. Mr. O'Reilly O'Reilly, Montnutty Nut. Have similar orders been issued for the slaughter of human animals who dare to play the Irish games in the Phoenix Park? Mr. All Fours. The answer is in the negative. Mr. Coconac Has the right honourable gentleman's famous Mitchellstown telegram inspired the policy of gentlemen on the Treasury bench? Oh, oh! Mr. Ulfors I must have notice of that question. Mr. Stalewit Buncombe Ind. Don't hesitate to shoot. Ironical opposition cheers. The speaker. Order! Order! The house rises. Cheers! There's the man, says Joe, that made the Gaelic sports revival. There he is, sitting there. The man that got away James Stephens. The champion of all Ireland. At putting the sixteen-pound shot. What was your best throw, citizen? Now, Berkeley's, says the citizen, letting on to be modest. There was a time I was good as the next fellow, anyhow. Put it there, citizen, says Joe. You were in a bloody sight better. It's not really a fact, says Alf. Yes, says Bloom, that's well known. Did you not know that? So, off they started about Irish sports and shoning games and the like of lawn tennis and about Hurley and putting the stone and racy of the soil and building up as nation once again and all to that. And of course, Bloom had to have his say too about it, for fellow had a rower's heart, violent exercise was barred. I declare to my auntie Macarasa, if you look up at a straw from the bloody floor, and if you said to Bloom, Look at Bloom, do you see that straw? That's a straw. Declare to my aunt he'd talk about it for an hour or so, and he would talk steady. A most interesting discussion took place in the ancient hall of Brian O'Sarnins in Shredna Britain Bieg, under the auspices of Slugnarenen, on the revival of ancient Gaelic sports and the importance of physical culture, as understood in ancient Greece and ancient Rome and ancient Ireland, for the development of the race. The venerable president of the noble order was in the chair, and the attendance was of large dimensions. After an instructive discourse by the chairman, a magnificent oration eloquently and forcibly expressed, a most interesting and instructive discussion of the usual high standard of excellence ensued as to the desirability of the revivability of the ancient games and sports of our ancient pan-Celtic forefathers. The well-known and highly respected worker in the cause of our old tongue, Mr. Joseph McCarthy Hines, made an eloquent appeal for the resuscitation of the ancient Gaelic sports and pastimes, practised morning and evening by Finn McCool, as calculated to revive the best traditions of manly strength and prowess, handed down to us from the ancient ages. L. Bloom, who met with a mixed reception of applause and hisses, having espoused the negative, the vocalist chairman, brought the discussion to a close. 
in response to repeated requests and hearty plaudits from all parts of a bumper house by a remarkably noteworthy rendering of the immortal thomas osborne davis's evergreen verses happily too familiar to need recalling here a nation once again in the execution of which the veteran patriot champion may be said without fear of contradiction to have fairly excelled himself the irish caruso garibaldi was in superlative form and his stentorian notes were heard to the greatest advantage in the time-honoured anthem sung as only our citizen can sing it his superb high-class vocalism which by its super quality greatly enhanced his already international reputation was vociferously applauded by the large audience among which were to be noticed many prominent members of the clergy as well as representatives of the press and the bar and the other learned professions the proceedings then terminated amongst the clergy present were the very revered william delany s j l l d the rat rev gerald molloy d d the rev p j cavana c s s p the rev t walters c c the rev john m ivers p p the rev p j cleary o s f the rev l j hickey o p the very rev for nicholas o s f c the very rev b gorman o d c the rev t mayor s j the very rev james murphy s j the rev john lavery v f the very rev william doughty d d the rev peter fagan o m the rev t brangan o s a the rev j flavin c c the rev m a hackett c c the rev w hurley c c the right rev manager mcmanus v g the rev b r statley o m i the very rev m d scally p p the rev f t purcell o p the very rev timothy cannon gorman p p the rev j flanagan c c the laity included p fair t quirk etc etc talking about violent exercise says alf were you at that co bennett match no says joe i heard so and so made a cool hundred quid over it says alf who blazes says joe and says bloom what i meant about tennis for example is the agility and training the eye ay blazes says alf he let out that milo was on the beer to run up the odds and swatting it all the time we know him says the citizen the traitor's son we know what put english gold in his pocket tree for you says joe and bloom cuts in again about lawn tennis and the circulation of the blood asking alf now don't you think bergen milo dusted the floor with him says alf heenan and sayers was only a bloody fool to it handed him the father and mother of a beating see the little kipper not up to his navel and the big fellow swiping god he gave him that one last puck in the wind queensbury rules and all made him puke what he never ate it was a historic and a hefty battle when myler and percy were scheduled to don the gloves for the purse of fifty sovereigns handicapped as he was by lack of poundage dublin's pet lamb made up for it by its superlative skill in ring-craft the final bout of fireworks was a gruelling for both champions the welterweight sergeant major had tapped some lively claret in the previous mix-up during which co had been oh, received general of right and lefts the artilleryman putting in some neat work on the pet's nose and myla came on looking groggy 
the soldier got to business, leading off with a powerful left jab, to which the Irish gladiator retaliated by shooting out a little stiff one flush to the point of Bennett's jaw. The redcoat ducked, but the Dubliner lifted him with a left hook, the body punch being a fine one. The men came to handy grips. Myler quickly became busy and got his man under, the bout ending with the bulkier man on the ropes, Myler punishing him. The Englishman, whose right eye was nearly closed, took his corner where he was liberally drenched with water, and when the bell went came on gamey and brimful of pluck, confident of knocking out the fistic uh, eblonite in jig time. It was a fight to a finish, and the best man for it. The two fought like tigers, and excitement ran fever-high. The referee twice cautioned Pucking Percy for holding, but the pet was tricky and his footwork is a treat to watch. After a brisk exchange of courtesies, during which a smart upper cut of the military man brought blood freely from his opponent's mouth, the lamb suddenly waded in all over his man and landed a terrific left to battling Bennett's stomach, flooring him flat. It was a knockout clean and clever. Amid tense expectation the portobello bruiser was being counted out when Bennett's second old thoughts wet steamed through in the towel and the sanctuary boy was declared victor to the frenzied cheers of the public who broke through the ring ropes and fairly mobbed him with delight. "'He knows which side his bread is buttered,' says Alf. "'I hear he's running a concert tour now up in the north.' "'He is,' says Joe. "'Is he?' "'Who?' says Bloom. "'Ah, yes, that's quite true. "'Yes, a kind of summer tour, you see, just a holiday.' "'Mrs. B. is the bright particular star, isn't she?' says Joe. "'My wife?' says Bloom. "'She's singing, yes. "'I think it will be a success, too.' "'He's an excellent man to organise. "'Excellent.' "'Ho, ho, begob, says I to myself, says I. "'That explains the milk in the coconut "'and absence of hair in the animal's chest. "'Blaze is doing the tootle on the flute. "'Concert tour. "'Dirty down the Dodger's son, off Island Bridge. "'That sold the same horses twice over to the government "'to fight the Boers.' old what-what. I called about the poor and water rate, Mr. Boylan. You what? The water rate, Mr. Boylan. You what what? That's the bucko that'll organise her. Take my lip. Twixt me and you, Caderish. Pride of Calpy's Rocky Mount, the raven-haired daughter of Tweedy. There grew she to peerless beauty, where Loquat and Almond sent the air. The gardens of Alameda knew her step, the garths of olives knew and bowed, the chaste spouse of Leopold is she, Marion of the bountiful bosoms. And lo, there entered one of the clan of the Omoloys, a comely hero of white face, yet with all some wrought ruddy, his majesty's counsel learned in the law, and with him the prince and heir of the noble line of Lambert. Hello, Ned. Hello, Alf. Hello, Jack. Hello, Joe. God save you, says the citizen. Save you kindly, says J.J. What'll it be, Nate? Half worn, says Nate. So, J.J. ordered the drinks. Were you round at the court, says Joe. Yes, says J.J. He'll square that, Ned, says he. Hope so, says Nate. Now, what were those two at? J.J. getting him off the grand jury list, and the other giving him a leg over the steel with his name in stubs, playing cards, hobnobbing with flash toffs with a swank glass in their eye, a drinking fizz, 
and he half smothered in writs and garnishy orders. Pawning his gold watch in Commons of Francis Street, where no one would know him in the private office when I was there, with Pisser releasing his boots out the pup. "'What's your name, sir?' "'Done,' says he. "'Aye, and done,' says I. "'Gob, you'll come home by weeping cross one of these days, I'm thinking.' "'Did you see that bloody lunatic bringing round there?' says Alf. "'You pee up.' "'Yes,' says J.J., looking for a private detective. "'Aye,' says Nate, "'and he wanted right to go wrong to address the court, "'only Corny Kelleher got round telling him "'to get the handwriting examined first. Ten thousand pounds,' says Alf, laughing. "'God, I'd give anything to hear him before a judge and jury.' "'Was it you did it, Alf?' says Joe. "'The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, "'so help you, Jimmy Johnson.' "'Me,' says Alf, "'don't cast your nasturtiums on my character.' "'Whatever statement you make,' says Joe, "'will be taken down in evidence against you.' "'Of course an action would lie,' says J.J. "'It implies that he is not compost metis. "'You pee. Up. "'Compost your eye,' says Alf, laughing. "'Do you know that he's balmy? "'Look at his head. "'Do you know that some mornings he has to get his hat on with a shoehorn?' Yes, says J. J., but the truth of a libel is no defence to an indictment for publishing it in the eyes of the law. Ha, ha, Alf, says J. Still, says Bloom, on account of the poor woman, I mean his wife. Pity about her, says the citizen, or any other woman marries a half and half. "'How half and half?' says Bloom. "'Do you mean he?' "'Half and half, I mean,' says the citizen. "'A fellow that's neither fish nor flesh.' "'No good red herring,' says Joe. "'That's what I mean,' says the citizen. "'A peshog, if you know what that is.' "'Begob, I saw there was trouble coming.' and bloom explaining he met on account of it being cruel for the wife having to go round after the old stuttering fool cruelty to animals so it is to let that bloody poverty-stricken breen out on grass with his beard out tripping him bringing down the rain and she with her nose cock a hoop after she married him because a cousin of his old fellow's was pewopin her to the pope picture of him on the wall with his smash all Sweeney's moustaches, the Signor Brini from Summerhill, the Italiano, Papal Zuave to the Holy Father, has left the quay and gone to Moss Street. And who was he? Tell us. A nobody. Two pair back and passages at seven shillings a week, and he covered with all sorts of breastplates, bidding defiance to the world. "'And moreover,' says J. J., "'a postcard is publication. It was held to be sufficient evidence of malice in the test case Sadgrove v. Hole. In my opinion, an action might lie.' Six and eight pence, please. Who wants your opinion? Let us drink our pints in peace. God won't even let do that much himself. Well, good health, Jack, says Nate. Good health, Nate, says J.J. There he is again, says Joe. Where, says Alf. And begob, there he was, passing the door, with his books under his oxter, and the wife beside him, and Corny Kelleher with his wool eye looking in as they went past, talking to him like a father, trying to sell him a second-hand coffin. Remanded, says J.J. 
one of the bottle-nosed fraternity it was went by the name of james watt alias saphiro alias spark and spiro put an ad in the papers saying he'd give a passage to canada for twenty bob what do you see any green in the white of my eye course it was a bloody barney what swindled them all skivvies and badhacks from the county mirth ay and his own kidney too j j was telling us there was an ancient hebrew zaretsky or something weeping in the witness-box with his hat on him swearing by the holy moses he was stuck for two quid who tried the case said joe recorder said ned poor old sir frederick says alf you can cord him up to the last two eyes heart as big as a lion says ned tell him a tale of woe about arrears of rent and a sick wife and a squad of kids and faith he'll dissolve in tears on the bench ay ay says alf reuben j was bloody lucky he didn't clap him in the dock the other day for suing poor little gumley that's minding stones for the corporation there near butt bridge and he starts taking off the old recorder letting on to cry a most scandalous thing this poor hard-working man how many children ten did you say yes your worship and my wife has the typhoid and the wife with typhoid fever scandalous leave the court immediately sir no sir i'll make no order for payment how dare you sir come up before me and ask me to make an order a poor hard-working industrious man i dismiss the case and whereas on the sixteenth day of the month of the oxide goddess and in the third week after the feast day of the holy and undivided trinity the daughter of the skies the virgin moon being then in her first quarter it came to pass that those learned judges repaired them to the halls of law there master courtney sitting in his own chamber gave him reed and master justice andrews sitting without a jury of the probate court weighed well and pondered the claim of the first charge and upon the property in the manner of the will propounded and the final testamentary disposition in re the real and personal estate of the late lamented jacob halliday winter deceased versus livingstone an infant of unsound mind and another and to the solemn court of green street there came sir frederick the falconer and he sat them there about the hour of five o'clock to administer the law of the brians at the commission for all that and those parts to be holden in and for the county of the city of dublin and there sat with him the high sindrahim of the twelve tribes of la for every tribe one man of the tribe of patrick and of the tribe of hugh and of the tribe of owen and of the tribe of con and of the tribe of oscar and of the tribe of fergus and of the tribe of finn and of the tribe of dermot and of the tribe of cormac and of the tribe of kevin and of the tribe of caelet and of the tribe of ossian there being in all twelve good men and true and he conjured them by him who died on rude they should well and truly try to true deliverance make in that issue joined between their sovereign lord the king and the prisoner at the bar and true verdict give according to the evidence so help them god and kiss the book and they rose in their seats those twelve of law and they swore by the name of him who is from everlasting that they would do his right wiseness and straight away the minions of the law led forth from their donjon keep one whom the sleuth hounds of justice had apprehended in consequence of information received and they shackled him hard and hand and foot and would take of him the bail the main prize but preferred a charge against him for he was a malefactor 
"'Those are nice things,' said the citizen, coming over here to Ireland, filling the country with bugs. So Bloom lets on he heard nothing, and he starts talking with Joe, telling him he needn't trouble about that little matter till the first, but if he would just say a word to Mr. Crawford. And so Joe swore high and holy by this, and by that he'd do the devil and all. "'Because, you see,' says Bloom, "'for an advertisement you must have repetition. "'That's the whole secret.' "'Rely on me,' says Joe. "'Swindling the peasants,' says the citizen, "'and the poor of Ireland. "'We want no more strangers in our house.' "'Oh, I'm sure that will be all right, Hines,' says Bloom. It's just that keys, you see. Consider that done, says Joe. Very kind of you, says Bloom. The strangers, says the citizen. Our own fault. We let them come in. We brought them in. The adulteress and her paramour brought the Saxon robbers here. Decree Nisi, says J.J. And Bloom, letting on to be awfully deeply interested in nothing, a spider's web in the corner behind the barrel, and the citizen scowling after him, and the old dog at his feet looking up to know who to bite and when. A dishonoured wife, says the citizen, that's what the cause of our misfortunes. And here she is, says Alf that was giggling over the police gazette with Terry on the counter in all her war paint. "'Give us a squint at her,' says I. And what was it only one of the smutty Yankee pictures Terry borrows off of Corny Kelleher? Secrets for enlarging your private parts. Misconduct of Society Bell. Norman W. Tupper. Wealthy Chicago contractor finds pretty but faithless wife in lap of Officer Taylor. Belle in her bloom is misconducting herself, and her fancy man feeling for her tickles and Norman W. Tupper bouncing in with his pea shooter just in time to be lit after she doing the trick of the loop with Officer Taylor. No, oh, Jake is Jenny, says Joe. How short your skirt is. There's hair, Joe, says I. Get a queer old tail end of corned beef off of that one, what? So anyway, in came John Wise Noland and Lenehan with him, with a face on him as long as a late breakfast. Well, says the citizen, what's the latest from the scene of action? What did those tinkers in the city hall at their caucus meeting decide about the Irish language? Oh, no, Lynn, clad in shining armour, low bending, made obeisance to the puissant and high and mighty chief of all Erin, and did him to wit of that which had befallen how that gr the grave elders of the most obedient city second of the realm had met them in the hostel and there after due prayers to the gods who dwell in either supernal had taken solemn counsel whereby they might if so be it might be bring once more into honour among mortal men the winged speech of the sea divided gale it's on the march says the citizen to hell with the bloody brutal Sernax and their patois. So, J.J. puts in a word. Doing the tough about one story was good till you heard another and blinking fox and the Nelson policy, putting your blind eye to the telescope and drawing up a bill and a tainer to impeach a nation, and Bloom trying to back him up moderation and botheration and their colonies and their civilization. The civilization, you mean, says the citizen. To hell with them. 
the curse of a good-for-nothing god light sideways on the bloody thick lugged sons of whores gets no music and no art and no literature worthy of the name any civilization they have stole from us tongue-tied sons of bastards ghosts the european family says j j they're no european says the citizen i was in europe with kevin egan of paris you wouldn't see a trace of them all their language anywhere in europe except in a cabinet de sens and says john wise full many a flower is born to blush unseen and says lenehan that knows a bit of the lingo conspuez les anglaises perfide abion he said and then lifted he in his rude great brawny strengthy hands the medher of dark foamy ale and uttering his tribal slogan lam dieg abu he drank to the undoing of his foes a race of mighty valorous heroes rulers of the waves who sit on thrones of alabaster silent as the deathless gods what's up with you says i to lenehan you look like a fellow that had lost a bob and found a tanner gold cop says he who won mr lenehan says terry throw away says he at twenty to one a rank outsider and the rest nowhere and buses ma says terry still running says he we're all in a cart boylan plunged too queer on my tip sceptre for himself and a lady friend i had half a crown myself says terry on zinfandel that mr flynn gave me lord howard de walden's twenty to one says lenehan such is life in an outhouse throw away says he takes the biscuit and talking about bunions frailty thy name is sceptre so he went over to the biscuit tin bob durren left to see if there was anything he could lift on the nod the old cur after him backing his look with his mangy snout up old mother hubbard went to the cupboard not there my child says he keep your pecker up says joe she'd have won the money only for the other dog and j j and the citizen arguing about law and history with bloom sticking in an old word some people says bloom can see the mole in others eyes but they can't see the beam in their own Ryamice, says the citizen, there's n no one as blind as the fellow that won't see, if you know what that means. Where are our missing twenty millions of Irish should be here today instead of four, our lost tribes? And our potteries and textiles, the finest in the whole world. And our wool that was sold in Rome in the time of Juvenal, and our flax and our damask from the looms of Antrim, and our limerick lace, our tanneries, and our white flint glass down there by Ballybar, and our Huguenot poplin that we have since, Jacquard de Lyon, and our woven silk, and our foxford tweeds, and ivory raised point from the Camelite convent in New Ross, nothing like it in the whole wide world where are the greek merchants that came through the pillars of hercules the gibraltar now ground by the foe of mankind with gold and tyrian purple to sell in wexford at the fair of carmen read tacitus and ptolemy even gerardus cambrensis wine peltries connemara marble silver from tipperary second to none our far-famed horses even to-day the irish hobbies with king philip of spain offering to pay customs duties for the right to fish in our waters what do the yellow johns of anglia owe us for our ruined trade and our ruined hearths 
and the beds of the barrow and shannon they won't deepen with millions of acres of marsh and bog to make us all die of consumption as treeless as portugal we'll be soon says john wise or heliolant with its one tree if something is not done to reafforest the land larches firs all the trees of the conifer family are going fast i was reading a report of lord castleton's save them says the citizen the giant ash of galway and the chieftain elm of kildare with a forty-foot bull and an acre of foliage save the trees of ireland for the future men of ireland on the far hills of ire oh europe has its eyes on you says lenehan the fashionable international world attended en masse this afternoon at the wedding of the chevalier jean weiss de nolin grand high chief ranger of the irish national foresters with miss fur conifer of pine valley lady sylvester elmshade mrs barbara love birch mrs paul ash mrs holly hazel eyes mrs daphne bears miss dorothy cairnbrake mrs clyde twelve trees mrs rowan green mrs helen vingadding miss virginia creeper miss gladys beach miss olive garth miss blanche maple miss maud montgomery miss mira myrtle miss priscilla elderflower miss b honeysuckle miss grace poplar miss omimosa-san miss rachel cedarfrond the misses lillian and viola lilac miss timidity aspinall miss kitty dewey moss miss may hawthorne mrs gloriana palm mrs liana forrest mrs arabella blackwood and mrs norma holyoke of oak home regis graced the ceremony by their presence the bride who was given away by her father the mcconifer of the glands looked exquisitely charming in a creation carried out in green mercerized silk moulded on an underslip of gloaming grey sashed with a yoke of broad emerald and finished with a triple flat of darker hued fringe the scheme being relieved by bretelles and hip insertions of acorn bronze the maids of honour miss larch conifer and miss spruce conifer sisters of the bride wore very becoming costumes in the same tone a dainty motif of plume rose being worked into the pleats in a pinstripe and repeated capriciously in the jade green turks in the form of heron feathers of palatine coral the senor enrique flor presided at the organ with his well-known ability and in addition to the prescribed numbers of the nuptial mass played a new and striking arrangement of woodman spare that tree at the conclusion of the service on leaving the church of st fiacre in horto after the papal blessing the happy pair were subjected to a playful crossfire of hazelnuts beech mast bay leaves catskins of willow ivy toad hollyberries mistletoe springs and quicken shoots mr and mrs wise conifer newland will spend a quiet honeymoon in the black forest and our eyes are on europe says the citizen we had our trade with spain and the french and the flemings before these mongrels were pupped spanish isle and galway the wine bark on the wine dark waterway and will again says joe and with the help of the holy mother of god we will again says the citizen clapping his thigh our harbours that are empty will be full again queenstown kinsale galway blacksword bay ventry in the kingdom of kerry killybegs the third largest harbour in the wide world with a fleet of masts and the galway liches and the cavern of rileys and the o kennedys of dublin when the earl of desmond could make a treaty with the emperor charles v himself and will again says he when the first irish battleship is seen breasting the waves with our own flag to the fore none of your henry tudor's harps no the oldest flag afloat 
the flag of the province of Desmond and Thomond, three crowns on a blue field, the three sons of Milesius. And he took the last swig out of the pint. Moya, all wind and piss like a tanyard cat. Cows and Connacht have long horns, as much as his bloody life is worth to go down and address his tall talk to the assembled multitude in Shanna Golden, where he daren't show his nose with the Molly Maguires looking for him to let daylight through him for grabbing the holding of an evicted tenant. Hear, hear to that, says John Wise. What we have? An imperial yeomanry, says Lenehan, to celebrate the occasion. Half one, Terry, says John Wise, and a hands up. Terry, are you asleep? Yes, sir, says Terry. Small whisky and bottle of alsop, right, sir. Handing over the bloody paper with Alf looking for spicy bits instead of attending to the general public. Picture of a butting match. Trying to crack their bloody schools, one chap going for the other with his head down like a bull at a gate. And another one. Black beast burned in Omaha, Georgia. No, Omaha, G.A. <laughs> A lot of Deadwood Dicks in slouch hats, and they're firing at a Sambo strung up in a tree with his tongue out and a buff fire under him. Gob, they ought to drown in, in the sea and electrocute and crucify em to make sure of their job. But what about the fighting navy, says Ned, that keeps our foes at bay? I'll tell you about it, says the citizen. Hell upon earth it is! Read the revelations that's going on in the papers about flogging on the training ships at Portsmouth. A fellow writes that calls himself Disgusted One. So he starts telling us about corporal punishment, and about the crew of tars and officers, and re arad morals drawn up in cocked hats, and the parson with his Protestant Bible to witness punishment, and a young lad brought out, howling for his ma as they tie him down on the butt end of a gun. A romp and dozen, says the citizen. What was that old ruffian Sir John Beresford called it, but the modern gods Englishman calls it caning on the breach? And says John Wise, "'Tis a custom move honoured in the breach than in the observance." Then, he was telling us the master at arms comes along with a long cane, and he draws out, and he flogs the bloody backside of the poor lad till he yells mere murder. That's your glorious British navy, says the citizen, that bosses the earth. The fellow that never will be slaves, with the only hereditary chamber on the face of God's earth, and their land in the hands of a dozen game hogs and cotton ball barons. That's the great empire they boast about, of drudges and whipped serfs. On which the sun never rises, says Joan. And the tragedy of it, says the citizen, they believe it. The unfortunate yahoos believe it. They believe in Rod, the scourger almighty, creator of hell upon earth, and in Jackie Tar, the son of a gun, who was conceived of holy boast, born of the fighting navy, suffered under rump and dozen, was scarified, flayed and curried, yelled like bloody hell. The third day he rose again from the bed, steered into heaven, sitteth on his beam and, till further orders whence he shall come to drudge for a living and be paid. But, says Bloom, isn't discipline the same everywhere? I mean, wouldn't it be the same here if you put force against force? Didn't I tell you, as true as I'm drinking this porter, if he was at his last gasp, he'd try to downface you that dying was living. We'll put force against force, says the citizen. We have our greater island beyond the sea. They were driven out of house and home in the black forty-seven. 
their mud cabins and their sheelings by the road were laid down low by the battering ram and the times rubbed its hands and told the white-livered saxons there would soon be as few irish in ireland as the redskins in america even the grand turk sent us his pastries but the sacknock tribe to starve the nation at home while the land was full of crops that the british hyenas bought and sold in rio de janeiro ay they drove out the peasants in hordes twenty thousand of them died in the coffin shops but those that came to the land of the free remember the land of bondage and they will come again and with a vengeance no cravens the sons of granai the champions of kathleen and houlihan perfectly true says bloom but my point was we are a long time waiting for that day citizen says ned since the poor old women told us that the french were on the sea and landed at calaya ay says john wise we fought for the royal stuarts that reneged us against the willamites that betrayed us remember limerick and the broken treaty stone we gave our best blood to france and spain the wild geese fontenoy eh and sarsfield and o'donnell duke of tetuan in spain and ulysses brown of camus that was field marshal to maria theresa but what did we ever get for it the french says the citizen set of dancing masters do you know what it is they were never worth a roasted fart to ireland aren't they trying to make an entente cordiale now at tepe's dinner party with perfidious albion firebrands of europe and they always were conspoir les francais says lenehan nobbing his beer and as for the prussians and the hanoverians says joe haven't we had enough of those sausage-eating bastards on the throne from george the elector down to the german lad and the flatulent old bitch that's dead jesus i had to laugh at the way he came out with that about the old one with the winkers on her blind drunk in a royal palace every night of god old vic with her jorum of mountain dew and her coachman carting her up body and bones to roll into bed and she pulling him by the whiskers and singing upon him old bits of songs about erin on the rhine and come where the booze is cheaper well says j j we have edward the peacemaker now tell that to a fool says the citizen there's a bloody sight more pox than pox about that boy o oh. edward gulf vettin and what do you think says joe of the holy boys the priests and the bishops of ireland doing up his room in maynooth his satanic majesty's racing colours and sticking up pictures of all the horses his jockeys rode the earl of dublin no less they ought to have stuck up all the women he rode himself says little alf and says dear dear considerations of space influenced their lordship's decision will you try another citizen says joe yes sir says he i will you says joe beholden to you joe says i may your shadow never grow less repeat that dose says joe bloom was talking and talking with john wise and he quite excited with his dunducketty mud-coloured mug on him and his old plume eyes rolling about persecution says he all the history of the world is full of it perpetuating national hatred among nations but do you know what a nation means says john wise yes says bloom what is it says john wise a nation says bloom a nation is the same people living in the same place by god then says ned laughing if that's so i'm a nation for i'm living in the same place for the past five years so of course everyone had the laugh at bloom and says he trying to muck out of it or also living in different places that covers my case says joe 
"'What is your nation, if I might ask?' says the citizen. "'Ireland,' says Bloom. "'I was born here. Ireland.' The citizen said nothing, only cleared the spit out of his gullet, and, gob, he spat a red bank oyster out of him right in the corner. "'After you with the push, Joe,' says he, taking out his handkerchief to swab himself dry. "'Here you are, citizen,' says Joe. "'Take that in your right hand and repeat after me the following words.' the much-treasured and intricately embroidered ancient irish face cloth attributed to solomon of droma and manus Ptolemach of macdonald authors of the book of ballymoot was then carefully produced and called forth prolonged admiration no need to dwell on the legendary beauty of the corner pieces the acme of art wherein one can distinctly discern each of the four evangelists in turn presenting to each of the four masters his evangelical symbol a bogux sceptre a north american puma a far nobler creature of beasts than the british article be it said in passing a caricaf and a golden eagle from carantwill the scenes depicted on the amunctory field showing our ancient duns and raths and comlex and grianus and seats of learning and maledictive stories are as wondrously beautiful and the pigments as delicate as when the sligo illuminators gave rein to their artistic fantasy long long ago in the time of the barmenicles Glendalough, the lovely licks of Killarney, the ruins of Clonmacnoise, Clong Abbey, Glenarg and the Twelve Pins, Ireland's Eye, the green hills of Talact, Cloak Patrick, the brewery of Messrs. Arthur Guinness, Sons and Company, Limited, Lownese Banks, the Vale of Avoca, Isolde's Tower, the Mapus Obelisk, Sir Patrick Dunn's Hospital, Cape Clear, the Glen of Eyehow, Lynch's Castle, the Scotch House, Rathow Union Workhouse at Lowestown, Tullamore Jail, Castle Connell Rapids, Kilbally Markshanhall, the Cross at Monasterboice, Jury's Hotel, St. Patrick's Burgatory, the Salmon Leap, Maynooth College Refectory, Curley's Hole, the Three Birthplaces of the First Duke of Wellington, the Rock of Cashel, the Borg of Allen, the Henry Street Warehouse, Fingal's Cave. All these moving scenes are still there for us today, rendered more beautiful still by the waters of sorrow which have passed over them, and by the rich incrustations of time. Show us over the drink, says I. Which is which? That's mine, says Joe, as the devil said to the dead policeman. "'And I belong to a race, too,' says Bloom, "'that is hated and persecuted. "'Also now, this very moment, this very instant.' Gorby near burnt his fingers with the butt of his old cigar. "'Robbed,' says he. "'Plundered, insulted, persecuted, "'taking what belongs to us by right. "'At this very moment,' says he, putting up his fist, sold by auction in Morocco like slaves or cattle. "'Are you talking about New Jerusalem?' says the citizen. "'I'm talking about injustice,' says Bloom. "'Right,' says John Weiss. "'Stand up to it, then, with force like men.' "'That's an almanac picture for you. Mark for a soft-nosed bullet.' old lardy face standing up to the business end of a gun gob he'd adorn a sweeping brush so he would if only he had a nurse's apron on him and then he collapses all of a sudden twisting around all the opposite as limp as a wet rag but it's no use says he force hatred, history, history all that there's not life for men and women insult and hatred and everybody knows that it's the very opposite of that that is really life. What, says Alf? Love, says Bloom. I mean the opposite of hatred. I must go now, he says to John Wise, just round to a court a moment to see if Martin is there. 
If he comes, just say I'll be back in a second. Just a moment. Who's hindering you? And off he pops like greased lightning. A new apostle to the Gentiles, says the citizen. Universal love. Well, says John Wise, isn't that what we are told? Love your neighbour? That chap, says the citizen. Beggar my number is his motto. Love Moya, he's a nice pattern of a Romeo and Juliet. Love loves to love love. Nurse loves the new chemist. Constable Fortinet loves Mary Kelly. Gertie McDowell loves the boy that has the bicycle. M.B. loves the fair gentleman. Li Chan Han lovey up kissy cha poo chow. Jumbo the elephant loves Alice the elephant. Old Mr. Vershoyle with the ear trumpet loves old Mrs. Vershoyle with the turned in eye. The man in the brown mackintosh loves a lady who is date. His Majesty the King loves Her Majesty the Queen. Mrs. Norman W. Tupper loves Officer Taylor. You love a certain person, and this person loves that other person because everybody loves somebody, but God loves everybody. Well, Joe, says I, your very good health and song. More power, citizen. Hurrah there, says Joe. The blessing of God and Mary and Patrick on you, says the citizen. And he ups with his pint to wet his whistle. We know those canters, says he, preaching and picking your pocket. What about sanctimonious Cromwell and his iron sides that put the women and children of Drogheda to the sword with the Bible text, God is love, pasted round the mouth of his cannon? Bible. Did you read that skit in the United Irishman today about that Zulu chief that's visiting England? What's that? says Joe. So the citizen takes up one of his paraphernalia papers and he starts reading out. A delegation of the chief cotton magnates of Manchester was presented yesterday to His Majesty the Alakai of Albuquerque Cuter in gold stick in waiting. Lord Walkup of Walkup the Eggs walk up on eggs to tender to his majesty the heartfelt thanks of british traders for the facilities afforded them in his dominions the delegation partook of luncheon at the conclusion of which the dusky potentate in the course of a happy speech freely translated by the british chap chaplain the reverend ananias praise god bare bones tendered his best thanks to massa walk up and emphasized the cordial relations existing between Abiquita and the British Empire, stating that he treasured as one of his dearest possessions an illuminated Bible, the volume of the Word of God, and the secret of England's greatness, graciously presented to him by the white chief woman, the great squaw Victoria, with a personal dedication from the august hand of the royal donor. The Alakai then drank a loving cup of fist-shot usebuck to the toast black and white from the skull of his immediate predecessor in the dynasty Kakatachak. <laughs> skull of his uh, surnamed Forty Wart, after which he visited the chief factory of Cottonopolis and signed his mark in the visitor's book, subsequently executing a charming old acubutic wardens, in the course of which he swallowed several knives and forks, amid hilarious applause from the girl Hans. Widow woman, says Nate. I wouldn't doubt her. Wonder did he put that Bible to the same use as I would. Same, only more so, says Linehan. And thereafter, in that fruitful land, the broad-leaved mango flourished exceedingly. Is that by Griffiths? says John Wise. No, says the citizen. It's not signed Shagatna. It's only initialled. P. And a 
very good initial, too, says Joe. That's how it worked, said the citizen. Trade follows the flag. Well, says J. J., if they're any worse than those Belgians in the Congo Free State, they must be bad. Did you read that report by a man what's his name is? Casement, says the citizen. He's an Irishman. Yes, that's the man, says J. J., raping the women and girls and flogging the natives on the belly to squeeze all the red rubber they can out of them. I know where he's gone, says Lenehan, cracking his fingers. Who, says I? Bloom, says he. The courthouse is a blind. Here's a few bob on throw away, and he's gone to gather in the shekels. Is it that white-eyed kaffir, says the citizen, that never barked a horse in anger in his life? where he's gone says linehan i met bantam lyons going to buck that horse only i put him off it and he told me bloom gave him the tip bet you what you like he has a hundred shillings to five on he's the only man in dublin has it a dark horse he's a bloody dark horse himself says joe mind joe says i Show us the entrance out. There you are, says Terry. Goodbye, Ireland. I'm going to God. So I just went round the back of the yard to pump a ship and begob hundred shilling to five while I was letting off my throw away twenty two. Letting off my load, gob, I said to myself, I knew he was uneasy in his two pints off of joe and one in slattery's off in his mind to get off the mark to hundred shillings is five quid and when they were in that dark horse pisser burke was telling me card plenty and letting on the child was sick god must have done about a gallon flabby ass of a wife speaking down the tube she's better or she's ow all the plants so that he could vamoose with the pool if he won oh jeez full up i was trading without a license ow ireland my nation says he hoik thuk never be up to those bloody that's the last of it jerusalem ah cuckoos so anyhow when i got back they were at it, ding-dong, John Wise saying it was Bloom gave the ideas for St. Fine to Griffiths to put in his paper all kinds of gerrymandering, packed juries and swindling the taxes off of the government and appointing consuls all over the world to walk about selling Irish industries, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Gob, that puts the bloody kibosh on on it if old sloppy eyes is mucking up the show gives us a bloody chance god save ireland from the likes of that bloody mouse about mr bloom with his argo bargo and his old fellow before him perpetrating frauds old methuselah bloom the robbing bagman that poison himself with the prussic acid after He's swamping the country with his baubles and his penny diamonds, loaned by post on easy terms, any amount of money advanced on note of hand, distance no object, no security, gob, he's like Lanty McHale's goat that'd go a piece on the road with every one. Well, it's a fact, says John Wise, and there's the man now that'll tell you all about it, Martin Cunningham. Sure enough, the castle car drove up with Martin on it, and Jack Power with him, and a fellow named Crofter, or Crofton, pensioner out of the Collector Generals, an orangeman Blackburn does have on the registration, and he drawing his pay, or Crawford gallivanting around the country at the King's expense. Our travellers reached the rustic hostelry and alighted from their palfreys. "'Oh, Varlet!' he cried who by his mien seemed the leader of the party saucy nerve to us so saying he knocked loudly with his sword hilt upon the open lattice 
Mein Hoist came forth at the summons, girding him with his tabard. Give you good den, my masters, said he with an obsequious bow. Bestir thyself, sirrah, cried he who had knocked. Look to our steeds, and for ourselves give us of your best, for a faith we need it. Lack a day, good masters, said the host, my poor house has but a bare larder. I know not what to offer your lordships. How now, fellow, cries the second of the party, a man of pleasant countenance, so servest thou the king's messengers, Mr. Tapton? An instantaneous change overspread the landlord's visage. Cry you mercy, gentlemen, he said humbly. And you be the king's messengers. God shield his majesty. You shall not want for aught. The king's friends, God bless his majesty, shall not go a fasting in my house, I warrant me. Then about, cried the traveller, who had not spoken, a lusty treacherman by his aspect. How ought to give us? Mine host bowed again as he made answer. What say you, good masters, to a squab pigeon pastry, some collops of venison, a saddle of veal, widgeon with crisp hog's bacon, a boar's head with pistachios, a basin of jolly custard, a metier tansy, and a flagon of old Rhenish? God zooks! cried the last speaker. That likes me well. Pistachios? Aha! cried he of the pleasant countenance. A poor house and a bare larder, quoth a tis a merry rogue. So in comes Martin, asking where was Bloom. Where is he? says Lenehan, defrauding win widows and orphans. Isn't that a fact? says John Wise. What I was telling the citizen about Bloom and the Sinfone. That's so, said Martin, or so they allege. Who made those allegations? said Alf. I, says Joe, I'm the alligator. And after all, says John Wise, why can't a Jew love his country like the next fellow? Why not, says J. J., when he's quite sure which country it is? Is he a Jew, or a Gentile, or a Holy Roman, or a Swaddler, or what the hell is he, says Nade, or who is he? No offence, Crofton. Who is Junius, says J. J. We don't want him, says Crofter, the Orangeman of Presbyterian. He's a perverted Jew, says Martin, from a place in Hungary, and it was he drew up all the plans according to the Hungarian system. We know that in the castle. Isn't he a cousin of Bloom the Dentist? says Jack Power. Not at all, says Martin. Only name six. His name was Virag, the father's name that poisoned himself. He changed it by deed, Paul, the father did. That's the new messiah for Ireland, says the citizen. Ireland of saints and sages. Well, they're still waiting for their redeemer, says Martin. For that matter, so are we. Yes, says J.J., and every male that's born, they think it may be their messiah. And every Jew is in a tall state of excitement, I believe, till he knows if he's a father or a mother. Expecting every moment will be his next, says Lenehan. Oh, by God, says Nate, you should have seen Bloom before that son of his that died was born. I met him one day in the South City Markets, buying a tin of Neve's food six weeks before the wife was delivered. On vente sa mère, says J. 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 <laughs> Do you call that a man? says the citizen. I wonder, did he ever put it out of sight? says Joe. Well, there were two children born, anyhow, says Jack Power. And who does he suspect? says the children. 
gob there's many a true word spoken in jest one of those mixed middlings he is lying up in the hotel pisser was telling me once a month with headache like a tutty with her courses do you know what i'm telling you it'd be an act of god to take a hold of a fellow the like of that and throw him in the bloody sea justifiable homicide so it would then slopping off with his five quid without putting up a pint of stuff like a man give us your blessing not as much as would blind your eye charity to the neighbour says martin but where is he we can't wait wolf in sheep's clothing says the citizen that's what he is a virag from hungary ah swearis i call him cursed by god have you time for a brief libation martin says nate only one says martin we must be quick at j j and s you jack croft in three half ones terry st patrick would want to land again at ballykinlar and convert us says the citizen after allowing things like that to contaminate our shores well says martin rapping for his glass god bless all here is my prayer amen says the citizen and i'm sure he will says joe and at the sound of the sacred bell headed by a crucifer with acolytes thurifers boat-bearers readers ostiari deacons and subdeacons the blessed company drew nigh of mitred abbots and priors and guardians and monks and friars the monks of benedict of Svotello, carthusians and carmadolesi cistercians and olivitians oratorians and valambrosians and the friars of augustine brigantines premonstratarians servi trinitarians and the children of peter nolasco and therewith from carmel mount the children of elijah prophet led by albert bishop and by teresa of avila calct and other and friars brown and grey sons of poor francis capuchins cordeliers minimimes and observants and the daughters of clara and the sons of dominic the friars preachers and the sons of vincent and the monks of st wulstan and ignatius his children and the confraternity of the christian brothers led by the reverend brother edmund ignatius rice and after came all saints and martyrs virgins and confessors saint seer and saint isidore arator and saint james the less and saint focus of sinope sinope and saint julian hospitator and saint felix de cantalice and saint simon stiltz and saint stephen protomater and saint john of god and saint ferro and saint lugard and saint the theodotus and saint vulman and saint richard and saint vincent of Poul and saint martin of toady and saint martin of tours and saint alfred and saint joseph and saint denis and saint cornelius and saint leopold and saint bernard and saint terence and saint edward and saint owen caniculus and saint anonymous and saint eponymous and saint pseudonymous and saint homonymous and saint paronymous and saint synonymous and saint lawrence o'toole and saint james of dingle and compostella and saint columcille and saint columba and saint celestine and saint colman and saint kevin and saint brendan and saint Fagidian and saint senin and saint Faknan and saint columbanus and saint gaul and saint fersi and saint fitton and saint fuca and saint nepomuk and saint thomas aquinas and saint ives of Brittany, and saint mission and saint herman joseph and the three patrons of holy youth saint aloysius gonzaga and saint stanislaus kostka and saint john berkmans and the saints gervasius servasius and bonifacius and saint bride and saint kiernan and saint canis of kilkenny and saint jarleth of tom and saint finban and saint papin of ballymun and brother aloysius pacifus and brother louis bellicosis and the saints rose of lima and of viterbo and saint martyr of 
Bethany, and St. Mary of Egypt, and St. Lucy, and St. Bridget, and St. Attracta, and St. Dimpna, and St. Eta, and St. Marian Calpensis, and the Blessed Sister Teresa of the Child Jesus, and St. Barbara, and St. Scholastica, and St. Ursula, with eleven thousand virgins. And all came with nimby, and orioles, and gloriae, bearing plumes, and harps, and swords, and olive crowns, in robes whereon were woven the blessed symbols of their efficacies, ink horns, arrows, loaves, cruces, fetters, axes, trees, bridges, babes in a bathtub, shells, wallets, shears, keys, dragons, lilies, buckshots, beards, hogs, lamps, bellows, beehives, soup ladles, stars, snakes, anvils, boxes of vaseline, bells, crutches, forceps, staghorns, water-tight boots, hawks, millstones, eyes on a dish, wax candles, aspergills, unicorns, and as they wended their way by Nelson's Pillar, Henry Street, Murray Street, Capel Street, Little Britain Street, chanting the introit in Epiphania Domini, which beginneth a surge illuminare, and thereafter most sweetly the gradual omnes which saith de Saba Benyet. Did they diverse wonders, such as casting out devils, raising the dead to life, multiplying fishes, healing the halt and the blind, discovering various articles which had been mislaid, interpreting and fulfilling the scriptures, blessing and prophesying, and last beneath a canopy of cloth of gold came the reverend Father O'Flynn, attended by Malachi and Patrick and when the good fathers had reached the appointed place the house of Ber Ber Ugh, the house of bernard keenan and company limited eight nine and ten little britain street wholesale grocers wine and brandy shippers licensed for the sale of beer wine and spirits for consumption on the premises the celebrant blessed the house and sensed the moolly and windows and the groins and the vaults and the arises and the capitals and the pediments and the cornices and the engrailed arches and the spires and the cupolas and sprinkled the lintels thereof with blessed water and prayed that god might bless that house as he had blessed the house of abraham and isaac and jacob and make the angels of his light to inhabit therein and entering he blessed the viands and the beverages and the company of all the blessed answered his prayers. Adiatorium nostrum in nomine domini, qui felit colium etarum, dominus vobiscum, et cum spiritu tuo. And he laid his hands upon that he blessed, and gave thanks, and he prayed. And they all with him prayed. Deus, quius verbo sanctificante omnia, benedictionem tuam effundi super creaturas istas, et presta ut quisquis ex secundum legum et voluntatum, tuam cum gratiarum actione usus fuerit per invocationem sanctissimi nominus tui corporis santianum et anime tutelam ti octore per sipayat per Christum dominium nostrum. And so say all of this, says Jack. Thousand a year, Lambert, says Crofton or Crawford. Right, says Ned, taking up his John Jameson, and butter for fish. I was just looking around to see who the happy thought would strike, when be damned, but in he comes again, letting on to be in a hell of a hurry. I was just round at the courthouse, says he, looking for you. I hope I'm not. No, Martin says, we're ready courthouse my eye and your pockets hanging down with gold and silver mean bloody scut stand us a drink itself devil a sweet fear there's a jew for you all for number one cute as a shithouse rat hundred to five don't tell anyone says a citizen beg your pardon says he 
Come on, boys, says Martin, seeing it was looking blue. Come along now. Don't tell anyone, says the citizen, letting a ball out of him. It's a secret. And the bloody dog woke up and let a growl. Bye bye all, says Martin. And he got them out as quick as he could, Jack Power and Crofton, or whatever you call them, and in the middle of them letting on to be all at sea and up with them on the bloody jaunting car. Off with you, says Martin, to the Jarvey. The milk-white dolphin tossed his mane, and, rising in the golden poop, the helmsman spread the bellying sail upon the wind, and stood off forward with all sail set, the spinnaker to larboard. And many comely nymphs drew nigh to starboard and larboard, and, clinging to the sides of the noble bark, they linked their shining forms as doth the cunning wheelwright when he fashions about the heart of his wheel, the equidistant rays whereof each one is sister to another, and he binds them all with an outer ring, and giveth speed to the feel of men whereas they ride to a hosting or contend for the smile of ladies fair. Even so, did they come and set them, those willing nymphs, the undying sisters? And they laughed, sporting in a circle of their own foam. And the bark clave the waves. But, be gob, I was just lowering the heel of the pint when I saw the citizen getting up to waddle to the door, puffing and blowing with the dropsy, and he cursed the curse of Cromwell on him, bell, book, and candle in Irish, spitting and spatting out of him, and Joe and little laugh round him like a leprechaun, trying to peaceify him. "'Let me alone,' says he. And he got, he got as far as the door, and they were holding him, and he bawled out of him. Three cheers for Israel! Arrah! Sit down on the parliamentary side of your arse, for Christ's sake, and don't be making a public exhibition of yourself. Jesus, there's always some bloody clown or other kicking up a bloody murder about bloody nothing. Go but turn the pot of sour in your guts, so it would. And all the ragamuffins and sluts of the nation round the door, and Martin telling the Jarvey to drive ahead, and the citizen bawling, and Alf and Joe at him to whist, and he on his high horse about the Jews and the loafers calling for a speech, and Jack Power trying to get him to sit down on the car and hold his bloody jaw with a loafer with a patch over his eye, start singing, If the man in the moon was a Jew, 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 and a slut shouts out of her. Oh, mister, your fly is open, mister. And says he, Mendelssohn was a Jew, and Karl Marx, and Mercadante, and Spinoza, and the Saviour was a Jew, and his father was a Jew. Your God. He had no father, says Martin. That'll do now. Drive head. "'Who's God?' says the citizen. "'Well, his uncle was a Jew,' says he. "'Your God was a Jew. Christ was a Jew like me.' "'Gob!' the citizen made a plunge back into the shop. "'By Jesus,' he said, "'I'll brain that bloody Jewman for using the holy name.' "'By Jesus, I'll crucify him, so I will. "'Give us that biscuit-box here.' "'Stop!' Stop, says Joe. A large and appreciative gathering of friends and acquaintances from the metropolis and great Dublin assembled in the thousands to bid farewell to Nagyasosis Urim Lipoti Virag, late of Mrs. Alexander Toms, printed to His Majesty on the occasion of his departure for the distant climb of Sags Harmonius Brutalius Jugulas. Meadow of Murmuring Waters. The ceremony, which went off with great eclat, was characterized by the most affecting cordiality. An illuminated scroll of ancient Irish vellum, the work of Irish artists, was presented to the distinguished phenomenolo phenomenologist on behalf of a large section of the community, and was accompanied by the gift of a silver casket 
tastefully executed in the style of ancient Celtic ornament, a work which reflects every credit on the makers, Messrs. Jacob Agus Jacob. The departing guest was the recipient of a hearty ovation, many of those who were present being visibly moved when the select orchestra of Irish pipes struck up the well-known strains of Come Back to Erin, followed immediately by Rakoski's March. Tar barrels and bonfires were lighted along the coastlines of the far seas on the summits of Hill of Howth, Three Rock Mountain, Sugarloaf, Brayhild, the Mountains of Morn, the Galtees, the Oaks and Donegal and Sparren Peaks, the Nagels and the Bogros, the Connemara Hills, the Reeks of Mikkilgudi, Sleevorty, Sleeve Bernag and Sleeve Bloom. Amid cheers that we rent the welkin, responded to by answering cheers from a big muster of henchmen on the distant Cambrian and Caledonian hills, the mastodontic pleasure ship slowly moved away, saluted by a final floral tribute from the representatives of the fair sex who were present in large numbers, while, as it proceeded down the river, escorted by a flotilla of barges, the flags of the ballast office and the custom house were dipped in salute, as were also those of the electrical power station at the pigeon house and the Poolberg light. Vizod Lazzara, Kedves Baraton, Vizod Lazzara, gone but not forgotten. Gob. The devil wouldn't stop him till he got hold of the bloody tin, anyhow, and out with him, and little Alf hanging on to his elbow, and he shouting like a stuck pig, as good as any bloody play in the Queen's Royal Theatre. Where is he till I murder him? And Ned and J. J. paralysed with laughing. Bloody wars, says I, I'll be in for the last gospel. But as luck would have it, the Jarvey got the nag's head, round the other way, and oof with him. "'Hold on, citizen,' says Joe. "'Stop!' Begorby drew his hand and made a swipe and let fly. Mercy of God! The sun was in his eyes, or he'd have left him for dead. Gorby never sent it into the country long, county Longford. The bloody nag took fright, and the old mongrel after the car like bloody hell, and all the populace shouting and laughing, and the old tin box clattering along the street. The catastrophe was terrific and instantaneous in its effect. The observatory of Dunsink registered in all eleven shocks all of the fifth grade of Macaulay's scale, and there is no record extent of a similar seismic disturbance in our islands since the earthquake of 1534, the year of the rebellion of Silken Thomas. The epicenter appears to have been that part of the metropolis which constitutes the Inns Quay Ward and the parish of St. Michan, covering a surface of forty-one acres, two roods, and one square pole or perch. All the lordly residences in the vicinity of the Palace of Justice were demolished, and that noble edifice itself, in which at the time of the catastrophe important legal debates were in progress, is literally a mass of ruins beneath which it is feared all the occupants have been buried alive. From the reports of eyewitnesses, it transpires that the seismic waves were accompanied by a violent atmospheric perturbation of cyclonic character. An article of headgear since ascertained to belong to the much-respected Clerk of the Crown and Peace, Mr. George Fortrell, and a silk umbrella with gold handle, with the engraved initials, crest, coat of arms, and house number of the erudite and worshipful cat chairman of quarter sessions sir frederick falconer recorder of dublin have been discovered by search parties in remote parts of the island respectively the former on the third basaltic ridge of the giant's causeway the latter embedded to the extent of one foot three inches in the sandy beach of holes open bay near the old head of kinsale 
Other eyewitnesses deposed that they observed an incandescent object of enormous proportions hurtling through the atmosphere at a terrifying velocity in a trajectory directed southwest by west. Messages of condolence and sympathy are being hourly received from all parts of the different continents, and the sovereign pontiff has been graciously pleased to decree that a special Misa pro defunctis shall be celebrated simultaneously by the ordinaries of each and every cathedral church of all the episcopal dioceses, subject to the spiritual authority of the Holy See in suffrage of the souls of those faithful departed, who have been so unexpectedly called away from our midst. The work of salvage, removal of debris, human remains, etc., had been entrusted to Messrs. Michael Mead and Son, 159 Great Brunswick Street, and Messrs. T. and C. Martin, 77, 78, 79, and 80 North Wall, assisted by the men and officers of the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, under the general supervision of H. R. H., Rear Admirable, the Right Honourable Sir Hercules Hannibal Habeas Corpus Anderson, K. G. K. P. K. T. P. C. K. C. B. M. P. J. P. M. B. D. S. O. S. O. D. M. F. H. M. R. I. A. B. L. Muse Duck. P. L. G. F. T. C. D. F. R. U. I. F. R. C. P. I. and F. R. C. S. I. You never saw the like of it in all your born puff. Gob, if he got that lottery ticket on the side of his pole, he'd remember the gold cop. He would so, but be gold the citizen would have been lagged for assault and battery, and Joe for aiding and abetting. The Jarvey saved his life by furious driving, as sure as God made Moses. What? Oh, Jesus, he did. And he let a volley of others after him. Did I kill him, says he, or what? And he, shouting to the bloody dog, After him, Gary! After him, boy! And the last we saw, the bloody car rounding the corner, an old sheep's face on it, gesticulating, and the bloody mongrel after it, with its lugs back, for all he was bloody well worth to tear from limb to limb. Hundred to five! Jesus! He took the value out of it, I promise you! when, lo, there came about them all a great brightness, and they beheld the chariot, wherein he stood ascend to, glo to heaven. And they beheld him in the chariot, clothed upon the glory of the brightness, having raiment as, the s as of the sun, fair as the moon, and terrible, that for all they durst not look upon him. And there came a voice out of heaven, calling, Elijah, Elijah! And he answered with a main cry, Abba, Adonai. And they beheld him, even him, Ben Bloom Elijah, amid clouds of angels, ascended to the glory of the brightness at an angle of forty five degrees over Donahoe's in Little Glean Street, like a shot off a shovel. End of chapter twelve.